David Newmark. Uh, we're really excited to have you here and uh, hear this uh, really exciting talk on does ageist language and job ads predict uh, age discrimination in hiring? So thanks a lot and really looking forward to the talk. Thanks so much for having me. You see, you see my screen? Yes, okay. Um, so this is joint work with Ian Byrne, Patrick Button, and Luis Carrello. Ian and Patrick are now professors at Liverpool and Tulane respectively. Luis actually runs the minimum wage study, the minimum wage commission in Mexico. So I'm lobbying him to run crazy experiments with Mexican minimum wages, um, but he's in his first year, so he's not quite willing to do that yet. Anyways, uh, this is, this is a, a project we've been working on for a while. So let me, hopefully, there we go. Um, let me just start out by just very quickly summarizing a paper some of you may have seen. I should say, by the way, before I, before I plunge in, this paper is about ageist stereotypes and age discrimination, uh, the methods we uh, partly develop and use, um, I think could be applied to any discrimination context where we think there are stereotypes in language, which is probably almost anything. Um, although some of the caveats um, that uh, Sendel mentioned yesterday, uh, maybe they're not caveats, but they may be relevant here um, and probably the context outside of discrimination literature as well. Um, uh, let me just start at the jumping off point. We did this very large scale correspondence study on age discrimination uh, published a couple of years ago, uh, about 40,000 applications to about 14,000 positions in 12 cities. Um, uh, very large study of this type. Uh, we did it for reasons because we were trying to explore a lot of variations in resume types and the like. So, so the large sample um, was, was important. Plus we had a really large grant, so we could just sort of keep going. Um, uh, but the large number of, of ads we apply to is, is critical for what we do in this paper. And we, we studied, as you always, in these studies, you always have to kind of pick a subset of occupations because you have to tailor the resumes. So just so you know what we're going to be talking about here, what I'm going to be talking about, we have administrative assistant and retail jobs for women, also retail jobs for men, and then as well, security and janitor jobs for men. So one job is the same for men and women. The other three are perhaps are a bit sex typed. And we and we do this based on, we chose these jobs because these are jobs in which actually there is quite a bit of hiring of older workers. You can see that by looking at the CPS data and the job tenure supplements. Um, we send out applicants uh, age around 30, 50, and 65 with a plus or minus a year. Um, uh, with, and, and I'm not going to go into the details of the experiment because that's not what this paper is about. Um, but the paper is a lot of, 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 of effort to addressing sources of bias in these kinds of studies, again, methods that don't just apply to age, um, but could be applied to any, any group any group we're studying. Uh, here's just a quick summary of the evidence. Um, the, two the, two bars, the two sets of bars on the left are the, are the, the, the female applicants, and then the three, are, the three next set are the male applicants. You can see there's always from youngest to oldest, that is yellow to gray, a decline in callback rates. Uh, you can also see that for women, that the, left, the bars on the left, uh, the pattern is much, it's actually bigger, the difference from youngest to oldest, and it's much more consistent. Um, this is just simple descriptive information. Uh, you know, we spend lots of pages and, and lots of econometric effort in the paper doing all sorts of things, but that's basically the answer. Um, there is evidence of age discrimination. It's stronger and more robust for older women. Um, that's kind of the jumping off point. Um, in the proposal, which Sloan funded uh, for the study, um, we had this sort of throwaway sentence at the end because I thought, oh, that's interesting. We said, I'm paraphrasing here. We will retain the text of the job ads to which we apply to see if we can detect ageist stereotypes in the ads that might predict employer behavior. Um, so it was a good prediction for a research project. I think this is an interesting paper. Uh, I had no idea how hard this was going to be. And, and much of what you're going to get is uh, a, 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 the, the condensed view of, of what we've done. Um, so what are the goals here? Um, a few. One is to learn about, I mean, the, the fundamental substantive goal is to learn about the role of age stereotypes in actual labor market discrimination. And when I say actual labor market discrimination, what I'm going to mean is the experimental measure from our study, where we sent out this triplet of applications. And I can see where the older applicant didn't get called back and the younger one did. And I'm going to call that a, you know, that's an employer who discriminated against older workers. Obviously, they get other applicants, not stars. Um, but we can relate that to, to stereotypes in the job ads. We're going to use text data from the thousands of job ads from our study um, to increase our understanding of kind of the why and how of age discrimination. And that sounds a little vague, and it's a little vague because I'm not sure this, there's a couple hypotheses of what's going on, and I don't think our data actually distinguish between them, but I think they're both interesting. So that's why I'm being a little vague there. I'm saying the why and how. Um, 
we we proceed in the following three steps, basically. One is we, we draw on the industrial psychology literature um, to identify the common age stereotypes that, that they have identified. And I'll tell you a little more about that. Most of those are negative stereotypes about older people or older workers, not all of them, and I'll show you that. Um, that's sort of the, a lot of work, but the easy part. Um, the second, which is the hardest part, is to relate the job ad language, that is the text of the job ads, to these stereotypes. And that's essentially um, a, a combination of computational linguistics and machine learning. The way I like to explain this, and it took me a while to figure this out, but I think it, it makes it very clear, is this is actually something you all do every day. Well, most of you do every day. Every time you do a Google search, you type in you know, a few words, maybe it's a paper, maybe it's a product or, or who knows what, right? And Google then returns a bunch of stuff and forgetting about you know, the ads they pay for and where they place them and things like that. It's, it's returning searches that are linguistically similar to what you asked for. And they're not exactly the same because you wouldn't want it to be worded exactly the same because that might leave out a lot. And if you ever go down to the 10th or 15th or 20th page on a Google search, there's usually not, no reason to. But if you do, the, the things it returns get sort of more and more wacky relative to what you've, what you've asked it to tell you about. And that's exactly what computational linguistics is. And a lot of the people who write the papers in this actually work for Google or other search engines um, about how to do this. And Google has an incentive to return text linked to pages that is closely linked to what you're asking about because that's what makes the search engine use. Um, anyways, so we're gonna get these, these measures of linguistic similarity between what's in the job ads and a set of age stereotypes. And then we're gonna go back to our, as I called our experimental measure of discrimination from the study and see if there are stereotype phrases in the job ads that actually predict whether employers discriminate. Um, uh, now, uh, the obvious you know, question is why would employers do that? Why write a stereotype job ad? Um, uh, just, to get, just to be concrete. Um, uh, the thing that shows up most commonly in the job ads, and actually for which we get pretty strong evidence for men, is language related to physical ability. So this is a great example because, um, uh, and, and commonly it's about ability to lift, and actually 40 pounds is used in tons of ads. I don't know why, they just, people, it's just something they settled on. Um, uh, so that's a great example of the issue here. Right? What, or what does that mean? So an employer, let's suppose, as we actually find, an employer uses that phrase, something like it. Um, it's related to the stereotype about older, older people or older workers, that they're not as physically fit. And it predicts that they're less likely to hire the older worker. Okay, so one hypothesis is employers actually want to discriminate. They don't want to hire older workers, okay? Um, and if I use stereotype language, I can shape the applicant pool so that fewer older, older, older people apply. And then when I hire fewer older people, I don't look as, as, as out of touch with my, with my applicant pool, right? And as someone who works in discrimination cases, you know, that's a very common type of data, the most common type of data in a hiring discrimination case. I have data on applicants, I have data on who gets hired, and I, I check for the underrepresentation of Blacks or women or older people or, or whatever it is. So if I can actually discourage people from applying, uh, I'm less likely to get caught, right? Uh, it's harder, harder to make a statistical case. Um, uh, so, so the second hypothesis is statistical discrimination. This is where physical ability is, is the physical ability stereotype is a good example because it, it, is, it is almost surely true on average, well, it's true on average, that, that physical, ability, physical ability does decline with age from 30 to 65, which are the max and min ages, or min and max ages in the sample, right? Um, Plenty of 65 year olds can lift 40 pounds, but on average, you know, fewer can. They might have a back issue or, or whatever. Um, and it's true that jobs have different requirements. Some jobs you actually have to lift 40 pounds. So an employer might care whether you can because they don't want to hurt your back and, and you know, have a workers' comp claim. Um, so employers write this in the job ad because it's, it's actually a requirement. Um, and they have a stereotype about older workers. They, they have an average in their head. It might be accurate, it might not be accurate, it doesn't really matter, but they act on it. So I put it in the ad because it's real, the requirement, and I don't hire older workers as much because I think they're, they're less likely to be able to do that. So both of those are consistent with, um, with you know, finding a relationship between stereotype language and what employers do. And as I said, we can't sharply distinguish between these. Um, uh, I, 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 I cut out a slide very quickly. From the point of view of the law, it doesn't matter. They're both illegal. The law is very clear. Social discrimination is illegal. Behaviorally, you know, as economists, we care. I should say, you know, one question you might be asking, based, especially based on hypothesis one, is 
um, do workers actually respond to stereotyped ads? Because um, if they don't, why would hypothesis one matter? We actually have an experiment in the field now. Um, uh, the, I, I often say that the Institutional Review Board at, at, at UC Irvine is very easy to work with because they're letting us run an experiment where instead of doing fake applications, we're doing fake ads and seeing who applies. So we're running, we're putting up fake ads, manipulating the stereotype language in the ads randomly and seeing how it shapes the applicant pool. First four or five months of this year were a bit rough because there weren't a lot of job applicants, but now going through the roof. Um, uh, so that's good. Um, so I'll know more about that uh, in about seven or eight months. Okay. Um, overview of the approach. Again, I'll, I'll, this now is slightly more detailed, and then I'll go through each of a fair amount of detail. So we identify the common stereotypes, as I said. We scrape the text of ads from the experiment and use computational linguistics to identify the similarity. Um, and then we estimate models which relate stereotype language and ads to what employers do. Now, we didn't do this with a sort of pre-specify and, and register the whole, the whole thing um, uh, because we didn't know exactly what we were doing and we had to figure out a lot of this on the way. But we did, I, I, I can say, although I can't prove it with a you know, timestamp registration, um, we were very much guided by developing mechanical procedures. We started out this project really wary of the possibility that someone would say, well, you just kind of found out which phrases predict discrimination, then went back and said, oh, a lot of ads have those, and those are the stereotype ones. So, so you know, you can, you can believe me or not, but, the, but, but more, most more importantly, having figured out how to do a lot of this, uh, one could take essentially the procedure we use, really pre-specify it, you know, and register it a field experiment before you went and collect the data. And I think that's a big advantage because there's a lot of scope. There's a lot of there's a lot of regressions, you know, for different age groups and occupations. There's a lot of stereotypes. There's a lot of job ads. There's a lot of scope for cherry picking here uh, if you don't do something like that. This isn't a study of sort of a you know a single coefficient or something like that. So I think that's important and value. Um, preview the results very quickly. Um, job ad language that predicts discrimination against older workers is associated with age stereotypes. I don't oversell the result. It's not always there for every stereotype. It's not there for every type of job. Um, uh, it's also a lot stronger for men than for women. We don't find much of this for women, even though we found more discrimination against them. Um, for men, the evidence is quite interesting. We have these three broad categories of stereotypes, health, personality, and skills. And we kind of find results very consistent with the industrial psychology literature for all three of those. And I'll, I'll show you that as well. Okay. Um, where do we get these stereotypes from? Uh, uh, not that interesting, but you know, we, we basically look at papers that focus on workers in the 50s or 60s, because that's our group of most interest here. We focus on more recent ones because people who study this say stereotypes about older workers have changed as they work more, as health has improved, et cetera. Um, this is a literature with a ton of meta-analyses. I don't know why. Um, we, did, we avoided those because people just start repeating themselves and you know the same studies get repeated again and again. Went back to the original studies, results that show up in at least two studies. And we come up with these 17, 17 stereotypes. Um, and uh, let me let me jump forward and then backward first of all. These are the 17 stereotypes we come we come up with, and I'll one more slide here. So so um, there's four under per, under health, and you can see they're all none of them are, are orange or yellow. They're all and that means they're all negative stereotypes about older workers. Then we have some about personality and some about skills. Um, the orange ones like careful, dependable, more experienced. Those are actually in the literature positive stereotypes about older workers um, that are held by employers or other people who get surveyed. Um, and the yellow ones are ambiguous. They actually show up both ways. In the so, so older workers are sometimes, uh, they have both negative personalities and warm personalities ascribed to them and better and worse communication skills and higher and lower productivity. Um, so we're not gonna, we're just gonna sort of let the data tell us what they tell us. Um, but that's the 17 stereotypes we actually use. Um, just to give you an example, here's the one for health. Um, and there's, this is a, a, not even the whole table actually. Um, in the in the paper, though, we you know we cite the study, and you can see under under let's say less physical less physical able, lower physical capacity, sedentary, physically handicapped, sick, shaky hands. These are phrases used in these various studies that people associate um, with older workers. And we actually, in something I will describe at the end, actually use these phrases too. Okay. Um, so that's the first part, pretty straightforward. Um, we'll see, you know, if. if Referees disagree on the stereotypes we write out. I don't think they will. Um, the second is, is matching the stereotypes to the words and phrases and job ads. And the obvious problem here 
is, you know, you don't expect to see them written exactly the same way, right? In fact, you tend not to put negative things in a job ad. You tend to put positive things in a job ad. Um, uh, you know, you wouldn't say, you know, technologically, uh, you might say technological na native, you, you wouldn't say, you know, must not be technologically obsolete or something like that. But also there's just a lot of ways to say things like this. Um, and we actually show um, that if you try to do sort of string matching, take all those phrases from those papers I just showed you and try to match on them directly, you get kind of garbage. Um, you get, and you just, because you just, the language almost never shows up in exactly the same way it does in any of the industrial psychology literature, which isn't surprising because these are employers writing job ads, not psychologists, you know, writing about age stereotypes. Um, okay, so the basic step, there's threefold here. We, we take, we train a model um, using the corpus of Wikipedia. Um, and what we mean by that is, um, this is actually what Sandra was talking about this yesterday. We you basically take all the all the all of the, the, the phrases that's sorry the sentences and paragraphs in Wikipedia as pieces of data, and essentially what you do is 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 this this version of a model which tells you that words are more similar to each other when when they're used near each other in Wikipedia in either a, a sentence or a paragraph. So whales and dolphins will have a high will will be similar to each other because they'll show up a lot in the same article. And even the same paragraph and sentence, and you know, whales and computers probably won't, right? Be very computationally, be very um, linguistically similar. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Something about uh, no, that's fine. Um, uh, okay, and then um, we we will we will take that and then character. We'll basically have, have two sets of language we're taking. We're, we're trying to link to each other. One is the stereotypes, right? Those seventeen stereotypes. And the other is going to be every single three word phrase once you throw out like what they call the stopping words of and, uh, and in, but all the all the meaningful three word phrases that are consecutive in the ads. And we're going to say, you know, how similar are is each phrase to those stereotypes. And what we're actually going to do is in each ad, we're going to take a phrase that's kind of, you know, kind of the, we're going to characterize an ad by the phrases that have a high a high similarity to a particular stereotype, not like the kind of the mean or the median. So we're going to say, look at an ad, take the phrase that's kind of not, we don't use the max, so it's noisy, but but highly, you know, so one of the ones that's most computationally similar, most linguistically similar, I should say, to let's say the physical ability stereotype. And we're going to characterize the ad that way. So two ads will be ranked higher or lower in terms of saying something about physical ability by whether the phrase in them that's sort of near the upper tail is more strongly related to physical ability or not. And that's gonna hopefully pick out an ad that says something about physical ability in a strong way versus one that doesn't say, doesn't say it as much or doesn't perhaps doesn't say anything at all. That's roughly the idea. Um, uh, so here's a sample ad just to show you this. I actually edited this down because it was a really tiny font I realized yesterday. Um, uh, uh, this is a service rep ad. You can see here there's language about reliable, energetic, customer friendly, detail oriented. You know, some of the, remember there was dependability was it was a, uh, was a stereotype that's probably going to be linguistically related to reliable. Energetic is going to be related to, to physical ability for sure. There was the uh, the warm personality. Uh, there's computer savvy, common to say things like that. Communication skills, that shows up directly. So you can see this is, I mean, this is a strategically chosen ad. This isn't a random one that has a lot of these phrases, but it's a real ad. Um, uh, and you can see a lot of these phrases showing up. So, so this will this ad would get characterized and I probably should have the numbers here to show you, as having probably fairly high linguistic similarity with a number of the stereotypes um, that we're studying. Okay. Um, how does this work? I, I don't know if there's a lot of detail here, um, but basically um, this is kind of what, what, what Senda was talking about yesterday. Uh, you have a jumble of words. There's actually over nearly 900,000 words in, Wiki, in the corpus of Wikipedia. Um, which is funny because there's only there's less than 200,000 words in the Oxford English Dictionary, but you know there's names and abbreviations and misspellings and all that kind of stuff. Um, and you project them onto a linear space. We use 200 vectors, which is a, seems like a high number relative to what people do in this literature. You're trying to reduce the, the dimensionality, so every word is going to have weights on these vectors. Um, and you you, you train the training the model is basically an iterative process of using this linear space to. To, to predict well how close to each other words actually are. So you can start with some random weights or something chosen more strategically, predict how close they are, see how close they are, and, and through an iterative process, 
um, converge on uh, you know, a, a good prediction. So here's an example. We have five words, athlete, carry, fit, lift, muscle. It's a jumble of words, but they are, they're sort of related. Um, you project them onto this linear space, which has the, these weights and then a bias correction term. And it's going to kind of rank them in you know, how close they are to each other. So here you get muscle, athlete, fit, lift, carry. And you can see these, you know, the ones that are close together here seem closer together in meaning. Muscle and athlete seem close together in meaning. Muscle and carry, not so much. But lift and carry seem close together. So that's sort of an example for kind of what this, this kind of algorithm uh, will do. Okay. Um, you then, you do that for words. As actually Sendel mentioned this yesterday, you can, you can, you can take sums or differences of words uh, um, to get, to get these, these vectors for a phrase. And I, I couldn't believe it. He actually had the same example that, that we have here, which is you can represent queen by king minus man. And you may remember he talked about that yesterday. And then he also said, I think, you know, his example of bias was uh, something about how intelligent and man in the context of woman became lovely instead of intelligent. Why does that happen, that bias? He didn't actually mention this. Because think about what the articles in Wikipedia are. Who's written about in Wikipedia, right? There's a lot of women scientists now, but there weren't many 100 years ago, and there aren't many with very long articles. I think somebody estimated about 10% of Wikipedia articles are about women in the first place. And I don't know this for sure, but I will bet you a lot more are about dancers and musicians and models and actresses than, you know, Sir Isaac Newton, right? Just because of who's written what about Wikipedia. So you can imagine why the language context when you use a corpus actually reflect that kind of bias, right? That that actually would happen. But in our case, that's fine because we're not, we're not trying to fix the bias. We're just trying to see how language tends to get used and, and then relate it to the age stereotypes. For what Sendel was talking about, um, it's potentially a big problem. Um, we complete what we use what's called the cosine similarity score. It's a measure that goes between minus one and one. Uh, one is the words are identical or almost identical. Um, uh, negative one is they're never used in the same context. So if, if, it, if in all of Wikipedia, two words were never used in the same paragraph or the same sentence, um, you'd have extra cosine similarity score um, of negative one. I don't know if that ever happens, but, 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 but some are close. Um, I should say, a problem with using these algorithms um, is, is you don't really get the more or less very well, right? Because because Wikipedia the, the methods aren't good for pinning that down. Um, so we don't sort of test separately like the more adaptable versus the less adaptable or the warm personality versus negative personality stereotype. We just look at personality and see which way it goes on that. And that's a problem that I, I, I I've talked to other people and read and seen other papers doing something like this. Uh, I don't know. There's a there's a, a clean a cleaner solution to that, but that's an open question still. Just to give you a sense of what one of these looks like. Um, so this is the cosine similarity score of all the phrases from all the ads um, with communication skills. Okay, and you can see there's there's you know it's centered above zero, right? Why? Well, because these are job ads, right? So a lot of, you know they're not gonna they're not it's not a random selection of phrases, and a lot of job ads are gonna have communication skills, so it makes sense it's centered above zero. Just to give you some sense, near minus 0.3, which is sort of actually the lower tail. A couple of phrases are Christmas season near and hotel near Seattle. They don't sound very related to communication skills. Um, near zero, still way below the mean and median, every Sunday PM, work year round. But one, excellent communication skills, prioritizing skill communication. I probably should have shown some here like in the 0.8 or 0.9 range because obviously these, these overlap completely. But you can see the ones with lower cosine similarity scores are unrelated and there's other evidence. I'll show you that, you know, as you get higher up. It by no means works perfectly. You get, you get weird stuff delivered for certain phrases, not surprisingly, um, but you get some sensible stuff too. Um, okay, so we take an individual job ad, we take a particular stereotype, calculate the distribution of cosine similarity scores for every three word phrase in that ad. And we're gonna take the 95th percentile. Um, that's somewhat arbitrary, but you want something in the upper tail to say, how closely is the ad, is kind of the most stereotype phrase in this ad related to that stereotype? Um, and you kind of sort of picking out the you know the relevant phrases in the ad because obviously a lot of three word phrases are are completely irrelevant to whether a particular stereotype is expressed. Um, just to give you a sense, here are um, so here's the here's the distribution of the of the um, this is a this is actually a single ad. Um, and we're showing you the distribution across all the phrases of the cosine simulator score with communication skills, physical ability, and technology. And the bar here is the 95th percentile. So you can just kind of see where these fall. 
So across all the phrases in an ad, there's a very wide range here. These go from minus 0.3 or 4 to 1, close to 1. Um, and they tend to be skewed with a long upper right tail, which, is, which means that there's a small number of phrases that are highly related to the stereotype, which isn't surprising because you wouldn't say a lot of times, must be able to lift 40 pounds. You'd probably say it once. And maybe, maybe some other phrase about, you know, physically fit or must be on your feet all day or who knows what. Um, I'm going to skip that slide because there's too much going on here. This is actually, uh, this is, the, this is the, the one slide I'll show you with more language. It's a little hard to read. It's a problem with this paper. There's just a lot to report. Um, so I'm, I'm showing you some of the stereotypes here. This is a subset. And remember, I had the, the, the um, I honestly am sitting here. I don't know why. I'm trying to remember why, why I code these colors. But what I'm showing you here is the mean of the 95th percentile across all ads. Um, so let's say, oh, I don't know. Uh, let's take let's take this one here, communication skills. So the mean of the 95th percentile, this is the this is the job, you know, this is we 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 the ad that is at the mean. We the three-word phrase is politeness absolutely fundamental, which sounds you know may, not clear. I mean politeness might be related to communication skills. You go one standard deviation above that. So the ad that is one whose 95th percentile is one standard deviation higher in terms of the cosine similarity score. Because in the regression, I'm going to show you one standard deviation difference. That's what I'm doing, one standard deviation. And you get client relation skills. And just a little above or below that, you know, one above, two above, because this is just one ad, right? Communication organization skills. Skills, ability, ability doesn't really say anything. Um, so some of these say things, some don't. Adaptable, oops, sorry. Uh, adaptable, you can see that, you know, the one, one, you know, just above one standard deviation higher, you have individual fast learner. Technology, you have computer skills proficiency. So, you know, you can look at this table. I think you could look at this table and say, it depends how long you stare at it and how much skin you have in the game, I suppose. You know, I look at it and say, yeah, this is kind of working. You know, uh, not every ad, not every phrase. Um, uh, you know, it, it's a bit of a, a, you know, a bit of a subjective call, but I think it's doing something fairly sensible if you, if you, if you look at these. And obviously we will, we will, you know, make, Sort of the whole, all these texts available so people can, can say whatever they want. Um, uh, finally, we identify, and this is the easy part, we identify which stereotypes in the job ads predict lower callbacks to job applicants. So, what we're going to use is we're going to take each triplet of applications and say, when did the young person get a callback and the old person didn't? We're going to call those the employers who discriminated against older workers. That happens in 11% of cases. Here's the distribution. So, most of the time, no one gets a callback, right? Because it's three ad, three, three applications and they're they're getting on average 100 or so. I know that from you know, the experiment we're running. Um, sometimes both do. Not very common for the old two and not the young. So, so this is the one we're focusing on where the young only um, uh, gets an application, get, uh, get, gets an offer. And everybody's going to run a, a probe it on you know, that outcome on across each of the 17 stereotypes. It's not 17 because some are more or less. The, I think it's 12, it turns out. Each of the stereotypes, the 95th percentile from that ad these are just some controls that are resume characteristics that don't make any difference at all. Um, and beta, and we use it, we're, we're standardizing this. So beta S is gonna capture the effect of the stereotype of, of a one standard deviation change essentially, um, which I think is, is a sensible way to think about this because the magnitudes aren't, aren't particularly meaningful. And we're gonna do this by gender and age um, and then by occupation. So um, there is a potential bias here that, that, that we thought about a little bit and, and there's a model in the paper Quotes, it's not much of a model um, that I think makes the case that this isn't very serious. And that is that if older workers really respond to stereotype language, right, the employer may not have to discriminate, right? So suppose the stereotype language knocks out every older applicant except the one we send because we're the dumb researchers doing an experiment, right? Um, well, then, the, the, you know, the employer gets 99 young applicants and one older one and, yeah, it calls back the older applicant because what the heck, it's only one person. Um, so that creates a bias against finding that stereotype language is associated with or predicts um, discriminatory behavior by employers. You know, so one, one way to, to view that is, since we find some evidence of that, it would only be stronger if that bias wasn't going on. But the model also makes the point that that bias is gonna be larger, the stronger is the relationship in the real world between whether employers use stereotype language and how much older workers discriminate, how much, how much um, how much employers discriminate. So if, 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 a wor if workers in the real world know that stereotype language means that if they're old, they're not gonna get a job offer, um, 
they're going to respond more strongly. And if, but if in fact stereotype language doesn't really predict employer behavior very much, and workers know that they're not going to pay much attention to it. So kind of when when the when the when the when the when the real effect is big, there's more bias. When the real effect is small, there's less bias, which I think is a good thing um, because it, it, it makes it more likely that what we find is, is a real relationship uh, or that we can find one if it's there. Um, so this is, you're going to hate the next table. I'm just going to give you a warning, but it, this is my, my attempt to summarize some results. I can't show you all of them because there's a lot of coefficients, but just to show you what we're doing here, this is for men, it says up here. These are the, the six categories. We have middle-aged janitors, middle-aged sales, security, and then old. Um, so we're running a model for whether, remember, the probability the young gets a callback and the old doesn't. That's that baseline probability right here. But, uh, okay. And, and then these are the stereotypes. Oops. So these are the probit coefficients. So, for example, this coefficient right here means that when, um, when the stare, when, when the 95th, when, when, when the, the linguistic similarity of the, of the ad is, is one standard deviation more strongly related to physical ability, there's a 0.038 higher probability that the employer discriminates against the older worker, which relative to this is about a 40% increase. So positive here means more discrimination against older workers. More likely the employer gave a callback only to the younger worker. Um, so here's the table you might hate, but let me just tell you what I'm doing here. Um, so uh, I'm highlighting in red the coefficients that says there's more discrimination. Okay, so there's my 0.038 I talked about before. I'm highlighting in green the ones that say less discrimination. So remember, careful is actually a positive stereotype about older workers. And when, this, when, the, when the language says something related to careful, um, there is less discrimination. Okay, so that's the green and the red. And then the lightly shaded are the ones that are kind of inconsistent with the industrial psychology literature. And the more darkly shaded greens and reds are the ones that are consistent with literature. So this is my attempt to try to summarize however many coefficients there are, or six by 14 or whatever, um, with, you know, with some colors. Um, uh, and what you can see here is, you know, there's a, there's a fairly large number of significant effects. Um, you know, there is a multiple testing issue. We correct for multiple testing at some point in the paper. And, you know, a lot of the p-values that are less than 0.05 go to, you know, 0.1 or 0.11 or 0.12. And, you know, we all know that happens and make of it what you will. Um, uh, but most, you know, but we, you do find a lot of evidence consistent with what the literature says. That's the darker shading, all these dark reds and these darker greens. Um, and only a couple, only really three exceptions out of, I think it's uh, whatever, 17 or 18, 18 coefficients to this table. So that's the basis for my, my, my summary when I said that uh, we get evidence for men that, that stereotype language actually predicts discrimination, and it tends to be consistent with the literature. And you see that for the health stereotypes and the personality stereotypes and down here, the skill stereotypes. Um, so I think that's kind of striking. Uh, for women, much more, dis much, much more disappointing. Um, uh, we, we don't find many significant coefficients. The ones we find are consistent with literature. Um, and actually these are the dependable personality. And I, I can't see the thing down here because that share bar is always in the middle of your screen. I don't think there is. Um, but nothing really adverse to older women here and a couple, a couple in their favor, again, consistent with literature. Well, I mean, dependable is a character, is a stereotype of older workers. Personality went both ways. So the negative here means on net. When employers use language about personality, they are favoring older, uh, older female athletes. Um, multiple testing I mentioned. Uh, I think I can skip the summary because I just said that. Let me tell you a little about supplemental analysis. Um, so this, we, we did some other stuff. This was obviously at odds with our attempts to be as mechanical as we could. But, you know, you deal with reviewers. You can't just ignore them. Well, you can, but then your paper won't be published. Um, uh, so, so one issue we thought about, um, and this was actually uh, something that was sort of clear from the beginning is, you know, the machine learning isn't perfect. And you can imagine some of the stereotypes where it's going to kind of break down. And I think, I think this is the most obvious one is the word experience or a phrase involving experience. Experience gets used three ways in job ads, as it turns out. Um, one is to say you should have a lot of experience some way or another. One is to say you don't need any experience or, you know, one year, you know, less than one year or whatever. Um, and the third is unrelated. So it might say, like, must provide great customer experience or pay is based on experience or something like that. Um, so experience is going to, you know, but especially the it's especially the first two, the lots versus none that the machine learning is going to have a lot of trouble with because it doesn't it doesn't really pick up the no or less or whatever phrases very well. 
Um, we spent months trying to write our own rules for how to use, how to kind of recode how the ads used experience. It didn't really change much in the end because about 75% of the ads by our you know, random sample and our hand coding are actually experience means more experience preferred. Um, but it's also really, you know, we also convinced ourselves and we described this in the paper to some extent, it's really hard to write these rules in any sensible way that will really, that will really be effective because you know, every time you write one, you know, 10 ads pop up with an exception. Um, and if you can't do it for this, which seems pretty straightforward based on the way language gets used in the ads, even harder to do for other things. So, so that, you know, a lot of effort didn't change anything. And in our view, actually bolsters the machine learning, which get, gets things in the right direction pretty well, obviously not perfect for man. Um, an easier thing to check is, is, you know, we use trigrams, we use three, three word phrases. Why? Well, you know, we sort of said that in advance, it seemed like you needed that to, to pin down the meaning. Um, we look at two and forward phrases, and here's a nice figure to, to show you the results are robust. This is just an example. This is men, middle-aged, and sales, again, relative to young. These are actually those coefficients I showed you earlier. Um, so remember, they were kind of in the 0, .0, you know, plus or minus 0.05 range. And this is just two, three, and four trigrams, the blue, red, green. And you can see these estimates look very similar, whether you use two, three, or four trigrams uh, in every single case. So that doesn't matter much. That's good because that's kind of an arbitrary choice. Um, one issue is, is, you know, why use the Wikipedia corpus, right? There's, it's, it's about everything under the sun, but it's also by no means a random selection of everything under the sun. It's stuff people have written about. Um, you know, who has a page or, or about them or what topic has a page written about it. Um, uh, so, and it's a huge corpus, of course, it takes longer to train the model. We, we, we used another, another method, they have great phrases in this, in this literature called scrapey spider, which I love. Um, and that is basically you, you pre-specify some phrases. And we use a bunch of phrases that are kind of relevant, ageism, aging, discrimination, workforce, job, stereotype, around a dozen, human capital, a few others. Um, and you just start with the Wikipedia page that matches that phrase, right, or closest to it. And then you take every page in that page, and then you can do as many layers of that as you want. And that gives you a much smaller corpus. We did two layers, like sort of two, two, two degrees of separation. That gives you around 65,000 pages, right, starting with those 12 and all pages and then all pages, relative to tens of millions of pages. Um, uh, and essentially what it's doing is reweighting the CS scores, the cosine similarity scores, to just ignore the connections on, to pages that are more than two links away, right? So you might think this would give you a sharper meaning. And if you actually, if you actually look at the phrases that match, we show some of this in the paper, you know, again, it, it, you know, it's hard to assess this. Just, now, now we're back to looking at language and subjectively interpreting it rather than doing it quantitatively. Um, yeah, it looks a little better. Like, you know, the phrases look a little more, like the top 10 phrases for a stereotype look a little better in a, Somewhat fewer phrases show up that just kind of don't seem don't seem to make sense. Um, uh, so we do that, and then we also do the string match. And we took my I showed you that table with like the health stereotype, not just um, you know like less attractive, but all the ways that gets written, wrinkled, whatever. We took all those phrases, which is there's a hundred or so of them from from the industrial psychology paper, and just matched on strings. And here's what you get if you do that again. This is an example, but it's very similar across each group. This is women in sales. The, um, the, the bottom one is, is actually what, what the full corpus, you can see those. The red is the scrapey spider, and you can see they're very similar. So I'm in here and here. Here's two significant ones. Here's two. One is significant, one is sort of just marginally significant. Um, I think this is the only case where they actually flip sign. The blue is the scrapey spider. Uh, sorry, the blue is the string matching. Sorry. And you can see the string matching. You sometimes don't even get the right sign here to here. And in, in many, many cases, the confidence interval, 95% confidence interval, is much bigger, right? You see that again and again and again. And that's just to say that the string matching doesn't work very well because you just get very few ads that, that literally match to the string as opposed to a continuous measure of how, how linguistically related the phrase in the job ad is to the stereotype you're studying. So we think the spider algorithm may make sense. It may be more efficient, actually. Um, a little more subjective if you don't if you're not going to pre-specify which phrases you use and we didn't because we did this in response to comments you know it's subject to a little fishing doesn't seem to make much difference the estimates actually are are not particularly are not necessarily more precise you think they might be but they aren't so probably doesn't matter much um we also met, messed around with just the google news um uh corpus um 
that didn't work as well. There's a ton of URLs in it and they're a little hard to strip out and a lot of other weird characters. So um, just didn't, didn't, didn't seem to pick up phrases that were nearly as useful. Um, so final thoughts and then I'll stop. Um, there's, there's a clear limitation here. Um, you know, not everything is gonna be picked up in job ad language. There's some things that are natural to say, like must be able to lift 40 pounds. Um, there are some stereotypes employers may, may have about older workers that are, you know, harder to express. Like, how do you express, you, you know, you can imagine many workplaces where if you thought people were hard of hearing, that would be to the detriment of the worker. Not, you know, but in many job ads, it would kind of be kind of weird to talk about someone's hearing, like for a retail sales clerk, but it just doesn't make much sense. Um, so that's a problem there. Um, that may be, I can only speculate here, why we find weaker results for women, even though uh, the discrimination from, from the correspondence study was stronger. It may be that the stereotypes about them, and most of the ads, I should say, for women are in administrative assistant jobs, um, just because there are tons of them, um, that maybe the stereotypes older workers have are just not the kind of things that, goes, that go in ads. So you just can't, you just don't see them as much. Um, uh, it's also possible um, that the la language is used less to try to discourage older women from applying because older women don't get as much protection from the laws. My, my, my former student and, and past and current co-author Joanne Song McLaughlin um, has this work on intersectionality of age and gender. Um, and that intersectionality, by the way, is, is sort of institutionally stronger in some sense, because those age and sex are not covered in the same act, right? Civil Rights Act is, a, is you know, race, sex, gender, uh, race, race, gender, ethnicity, religion, et cetera. The ADA is separate and courts have, have actually ruled explicitly, you cannot combine claims. You can't sort of use a, an age by gender interaction in your statistical model. So if the older women are being discriminated against more strongly than the older men, it's hard to, it's hard. Not only is the, uh, sort of the, some of the, you know, the fuzzier issues about intersectionality, but it's literally harder to make a statistical case. Um, so maybe employers don't have to do it as much. I, I think one implication is that the policy response may have to be somewhat more nuanced. If, if, if ads affect the applicant pool, and this paper doesn't show that, but it suggests that's the reason, the next experiment we're doing I honestly don't know the answer. I would, I would give you a, I would foreshadow it for you. Um, but if, a, if ads affect the applicant pool, it may be harder to detect, to detect discrimination. What actually goes on in discrimination cases is, in a hiring case, is, is uh, ideally there's an applicant date, right? And then you compare the higher rate of the group to the, you know, the application rate, and that's sort of a measure of discrimination. Um, uh, you know, uh, if the applicant data aren't available, you do a comparison to like external benchmarks like the ACS or something, that's harder. That's just a harder case to make. You don't really know who applied for the jobs. Um, but if in fact applicants are being discouraged, it may be harder to detect discrimination. Um, the, uh, plaintiff's attorneys talk about variable, variables being tainted, which is what we, we use the phrase over controlling. So if application rates themselves reflect discrimination, they may not provide a good measure. Um, so the idea here is that this could actually put some meat on that as to whether that happens. Um, you know, how could this be used? Well, I'll do the second point first. You know, there's, there's, other, there's other contexts, many where we have similar texts. Some of you may recall, I, I forgot, I didn't put the reference here and I'm forgetting at the moment. It's a paper, it must have been 10 years ago, maybe more, where somebody was studying uh, recommend, job recommendations for PhD candidates and, and the language they used to describe male and female uh, graduate students. Um, you know, not done in a very systematic, quantitative way, because I'm, I'm not sure we even knew how to when the paper was written. But obviously, you know, you can use some, an approach like this um, to make that more systematic. You could do this in other correspondence studies because you're always responding to ads um, and, and other markets. And, and uh, my co-author, Ian Byrne, was in Sweden until recently, um, uh, was working with somebody on, um, on court decisions, actually, to kind of use this language to study the judge's decisions. Um, and finally, the EOC... Uh, is actually pretty attuned to the language in job ads. I would say the thing they are most attuned to is, lately at least, is uh, job ads referring to criminal background. Um, you know, saying, you, you know, to employers, they have, I don't know if you know this, but they, right, there's the law, of course, which is, which is not very long and detailed. There's the Code of Federal Regulations, which is sort of how each agency says this is what it really means. But the EOC offers all this guidance to employers all the time. And there's a lot of guidance on, on criminal background language where they're basically saying, you know, don't say that if it doesn't matter for the job, because given arrest rate differences between blacks and whites, it's going to have an adverse impact. Now, if the job really, you know, if it's a bona fide requirement for the job, if you're, you know, childcare worker or a bank teller or who knows what, 
maybe you can, maybe you, maybe it's justified, but if you're talking about people laying asphalt in North Dakota, uh, it probably isn't. So that they issue guidance like that. But here's guidance on the slide about language. Uh, it says notices or advertisements that contain terms such as age, obviously, college student, recent college graduate. Um, and they talk about other things not related to age, um, a boy, girl, which are young, um, uh, you know, violates, uh, can violate the act. Um, uh, and so what, what, what our kind of study can do is say that language actually matters, right? It's not just, and not just, yeah, maybe they're discriminating because they say this, but we actually find some evidence that maybe they in fact are. And I'm not saying anyone should be sued based on running a stereotype job ad, but as an indicator of how, of what, of whether an employer might be discriminating, um, it may not be a bad thing to look at. Um, it's actually pretty, you might, you might think this isn't a very serious problem. And obviously, you know, since we passed civil rights legislation, ads don't say, you know, when men only, no blacks, you know, older workers need not apply or whatever. Um, but there was a case somewhat recently um, where a law firm, it was Kleber was the name of the, the, the plaintiff, a law firm ran an ad for lawyers saying maximum seven years of experience. Right. Which unless people going to old law school at pretty old ages is going to pretty much exclude most, you know, most older lawyers. And to my amazement, actually, the, the court kicked that. They said they said um, they didn't have a case. But I think uh, that illustrates that language, even a lot more blatant than the kind of stuff we might detect with these methods, um, could actually play uh, a real role. in the way. So I'll stop there and leave some time for questions. I know everyone's a little burned out by now, but I'm happy to, happy to do whatever I can. Well, thanks, thanks a lot, David. Uh, that was wonderful. Uh, and uh, so we, we have time for some questions and uh, Matt uh, has got his hand raised. Hi, yeah, no, very interesting. Um, I, I had a couple of related questions. I thought your point about the fact that uh, ageist language is more predictive of discrimination for men, um, but yet we find actual more discrimination against older women is really interesting. And I was wondering, the extent to which that might be explained by, you know, the nature of the type of age discrimination. So it looks like for for males, um, the types of discrimination where you're uh, you're you're getting a lot of uh, uh, traction is when physical character or physical ability is involved. Whereas for women, if you think that it's physical attractiveness, I would imagine that, you know, it's probably more illegal if that's the right way to say it. Um, or less socially acceptable to say things in the ad related to physical attractiveness. So I kind of wonder about like how yeah. well the language surrounding physical attractiveness actually captures, um, you know, uh, what, what employers' preferences are. And then a related question on the physical attractiveness question, and I think this relates more to your 2019 paper. Um, I was wondering the extent to which you might even, you know, argue that this uh, preference for more physical attractive workers is the result of, uh, uh, or is consistent with the model of consumer-based discrimination. Um, and so whether, for example, like I think in, in your data, you could actually look at discrimination against older women based on whether they're in admin or sales positions where sales positions are more consumer facing, right? Right. So, so I'll start with the last question because that's the one I remember best. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I think I think you're sure. I, well, these are all related. I think for sure you're 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 you know when I when I when I sort of ever describe the results from the 2019 paper to, to to lay people, and I love to talk to my work, you know, not economists, and you tell them older women suffer more discrimination in the labor market than older men, they look at you and they say, <laughs> and how much time did you spend to figure this out? Because <laughs> like, it all seems they they think it's very obvious to them. Um, I gave the paper at a at, at Clemson a long time ago, and. To my amazement, somebody trotted out the study they had written. I don't know why they wrote it, but um, they had taken uh, IMDb data going back like 70 years on kind of, you know, kind of big movies, not little ones. Um, uh, and the age spread between the male and female leads, right? And it's been about seven for 70 years, right? It hasn't changed. You know, if you think movies are based on consumer taste, which is a pretty good model of behavior, um, it seems like that's a strong preference. And my, my other favorite movie quip is, you know, there's, there's lots of movies with older men and younger women, and the two movies with older women and younger men are both cult films, right? The Graduate and, and Harold and Maude. So um, clearly there's, there's, some, there's some social difference here. Um, and I think you're right. I think you do see, yeah, right, you're right. I mean, phys, you, you couldn't imagine, and I don't, no, I haven't read every ad, but, but I don't, I'm pretty sure I haven't seen an ad that says, you know, must be good looking, right? Like Peter Kuhn stuff on, you know, the China ads where you can say whatever you want. Um, uh, 
uh, whereas you can say must be able to lift 40 pounds. You do see things in retail, um, which, you know, fashionable, modern, you know, sort of kind of giving the sense that this is a, you know, a store for young people and you should sort of fit in with that. You, you know, you see ads like that, but again, there, there aren't as many of them. Um, and, uh, and I agree for administrative assistant, you could, you know, you could imagine it's the fuzzier skills. And, and we know we saw earlier that things like communication skills, which could matter a lot in those jobs, um, you know, personality to some extent, the, the stereotypes aren't even very clear on those, right? It's not even, it's not even clear that if you go to the stereotypes that have been identified, they're particularly unidirectional against older workers. I think all those things can work, can work against that. And, 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 I mean, I don't know that for, you know, I was going to say for technology, we know, I guess we know advanced technology is more male dominated, you know, the technological skills in these jobs, I don't, that may not be so much of an issue. Um, you know, the, what you need, I mean, the, the one way of men and women is retail sales. Um, there is some technology requirements there for kind of these point of sale systems, but I don't think those are the kind of things that you know, men are better at than women because they're, they're not very complicated. Um, but those are, yeah, those are reasonable conjectures. Um, I don't think we know enough about, you know, I'm reluctant to do the consumer discrimination thing based on just, just two jobs. Um, but people have studied that in, you know, in other ways based on, you know, the demographic composition of who lives there and things like that. And um, yeah, I, I think there's ample evidence that, that that may be what's going on. And I've certainly seen that in the, some of the expert witness work I've done where that seems pretty clear um, that that's what's going on against both older men and older women. Thanks, David. Um, Conrad's got a question. Thanks, David. I, uh, I enjoyed this, particularly as someone that has struggled to uh, try and incorporate NLP tools in my own work. I'm glad to see some some uh, success here. Uh, one thing I was I was curious I struggle about, any, struggle anyways. <laughs> uh, well, so one thing I'm curious about is how much if you've tried kind of benchmarking the predictive power you get from your, your NLP classifications into these categories um, versus something a little less constrained. So for example, what if you just had people, do you think if you just had people read some of these job ads, some undergrads maybe, and just try and predict which ones are gonna be discriminatory just based on the language. So they're, they're incorporating, you know, whatever they want to incorporate. Like, I, I wonder how much better or worse they would do than your kind of NLP-based predictions. Well, better or worse, here we're, I mean, that sounds relevant to predicting sort of, would you apply, right? Whereas here we're studying employer behavior. But I, I or, or do you mean, or do you, are you thinking a way to tie that to employer behavior? Well, I'm just thinking is, I'm wondering if there are other aspects of the language that your classifications might be, other aspects of the language that are highly predictive for um, age discrimination on the part of employers yes. that your categories are missing that uh -huh. maybe just a reader would pick up on. Well, that's an interesting question. So let me tell you something, and I hadn't thought of this, but so I, I mentioned we're doing this other experiment where we actually manipulate the ads, right? Um, and the main thing we do there is we actually, we take phrases that the exact techniques we use here identify as, as strongly stereotyped. And we do, as I recall, the three where we get the strongest results, we do physical ability, technology, and communication skills. And we manipulate those with sort of, you know, high CSS score phrases. And we put those in some ads and we leave them out of other ads randomly. Um, but we also actually went to an, A, and this may be what you're talking about, we went to some, an AARP source, which sort of talks about the evils of stereotype language and it's some really blatant language. It's not particularly tied to one stereotype or the other because it wasn't, you know, whereas our, we, we chose phrases that really, you know, shifted the CSS for just one of the stereotypes and not the others. So we can sort of test that. The AARP ones are just sort of generic, but if you read them, like you're suggesting, you'd say, whoa, you know, that sounds like they really don't want old people to apply. Um, we, we actually tested all these phrases on MTurk before we ran the experiment where we just sort of, you know, got recruited people of these three age ranges and asked, you know, if they, if they perceived as a stereotype and it works for both of them, but, but the AARP ones, even though we can't tie the specific stereotypes are, are, are perceived as more discriminatory 
than the other one. So I hadn't thought about string matching or something a little fuzzier um, on that AARP type language. Because it may be, I think is what you're saying, you know, we focus on these stereotypes ex ante, but employers may just put in stuff that isn't related so much to any one stereotype, but is pretty blatant. Um, that's not, that's a, that's an interesting idea, whether we could, you know, string match or something close. I'm not sure what it would be. I'd have to think about that more on, on those kinds of phrases. Cause when you read them, they're, they're, you know, they, they, I mean, they come from a document that was written to make a point. So maybe that's not surprising. Um, and maybe they're not actually that prevalent, but they certainly got them from some ads. Um, they're, they're pretty clear. You would, they would, if anything was going to deter you, um, those would, and I suspect that's what we're going to find in the experiment, but we don't. I did interpret your suggestion. That's what you're saying, Conrad, right? Yeah, more or less. Yeah. yeah. Um, now I'm curious what these ARP phrases were. Uh, oh, if you remember, uh, I, will, I will try to get them up now because I want to screen unplug <laughs> so PowerPoint works. But it'll, it'll. I, I'm happy to uh, share share them with you. No secrets. Any other questions? Thanks so much. Appreciate listening and the comments. Thank you so much. So uh, with that, uh, we're going to wrap up.